Check one, check two. Hey, hey, hey. It's G from the Academy. It's a rather dull, damp, and pretty dark morning here. Semi typical, I would say, of the northeast coast of Scotland. The sun is out there somewhere, hidden behind a thick duvet of clouds. That's the way it goes. How are you today? How is it going? Trying to do this semi quietly, which is absolutely impossible, as there's people sleeping over there. Hello to the people sleeping. Yeah. Hello, hello to the people sleeping. People sleeping said they're gonna get up early this morning. <laughs> and <laughs> Symbolism. Symbolism. I believe that's the number one. <laughs> that's what I believe. Right. Should we dive into uh, the news, views, reviews, and everything that has been happening? Um, New York Times reports, as, as it does, about changes to the dictionary, right? Because when you can't win the rational, logical argument, you just change the definition of the words. Not that things don't need to be updated from time to time, but there's no point changing the dictionary in a reactionary way to things that are just happening. And also, if you change the definition of words, it changes people's understanding of history when they look at those words. The classic example of this is the word regulation, which originally meant to keep regular, meaning to allow to happen. But as it was more and more used by authorities and systems of power, regulation came to mean limitation. So rather than keep things open, it came to mean shut things down. Which is why when you look at documents like the American Declaration of Independence and documents that surround that, and it says that the function and role of government is to keep things regular, it doesn't mean to limit people's movement, it doesn't mean to limit people's business, it doesn't mean to limit people's activity. Um, what it means is to ensure that government doesn't get in the way, right? So we have to be very careful about redefining words. In fact, it's probably better to use new words, new terms, rather than try to redefine old words. And that's what, that's what happens, that's how new words enter the language, they're a requirement. They're also part of the complex system of control that exists in terms of language. You know if a word doesn't exist, it's very hard to express yourself correctly. Classic example of that would be the use of the word love in different languages, where in many languages there are many different forms and different types and different kinds of love that can be expressed with different words. This is where the, the English language kind of fails because it's only got that, that one word that's used. It's similar to like the Eskimos have so many different words for snow, but 
in lots of parts of the world there's just, there's just one right like in Scotland we have all these different kinds of rain or these different words to describe it because it rains a lot anyway that's the background of language and control New York Times writes this entry has not been revised in decades and what they're doing is they're revising uh, terms used which which is a little bit dangerous because if you learn the new definition and you read an old text then it takes on a different meaning it takes on a different connotation so um, writing about the word racism they say this entry has not been revised in decades he said adding that it was not a new division of the words meanings but an improvement of the wording so by changing it they're saying that they're improving it hmm we don't change other words right we don't change the word chair or, or, or other nouns we don't change the meaning of other nouns it's an improvement of the word as a student at Drake University in Des Moines, Mrs. Uh, Mitchum has noticed in discussions about racism that white people sometimes defend their arguments by cutting and pasting the definition from the dictionary. Well, it's not really an argument to cut and paste a definition, but it's very important to understand the terms of how the word is used. So in late May, as protest against racism and police violence grew, um, protests, you mean vandalism, looting, burning police cars, taking over parts of cities, beating up people on the street, um, all that stuff. Mrs. Mitchum 22 wrote to the editors at Merriam-Webster to argue that the entry should be revised to better reflect how systemic racism was in society. Racism is not only prejudice against a certain race due to color of a person's skin, as it states in your dictionary, she wrote, it is both prejudice combined with social and institutional power. It is a system of advantage based on skin color well it, it's not because that's not the definition that's your redefinition of it that's your experience of it and changing the definition of the word because you've had a different experience is to not understand how language actually should work yes for sure in all areas of community in all areas of society there's some level of prejudice that exists but it doesn't mean that we should redefine the words in the dictionary yeah um, basically anyone anyone born into any supportive family into any practical developmental logical supportive community it's gonna have some kind of advantage right that's the way that it works if, you, if you're born with great parents then you're gonna have an advantage in life that's the way that it works and that's not based on skin color as based on the practical logical thinking and the hard work done by the parents there as great societies are built by people who put in the effort to do the hard work and because of this single person the Merriam-Webster system says they're now going to redefine the word because of the actions of this person yeah think of that what you will right I wonder what this person would say about the monoculture of videos that have appeared on Twitter recently showing compilations of all the looting of large stores that's happened across the United States and um, if you look at the videos there's actually very few uh, white people in the videos who appear to be looting now of course they're going to be white people looting right maybe the white people sent the black people in to loot maybe they're being controlled and manipulated but 
you still need people to commit the crimes. So, um, so there's videos now of hundreds of people running in to these different um, big box stores, breaking into them, looting them, and taking stuff out. And um, 90 plus percent, some of the videos 100 percent, right? But at least 90 plus percent of the people appear to be from what we termed in the past as ethnic minorities, but uh, they definitely appear to be from from colored colored groups. And if there is all this racism um, going on, uh, the word exists, so it does exist within societies, right? If there is all this racism going on, how come everybody wants to get into the European Christian cultures, right? How come everybody from North Africa wants to get into Europe? How come everybody from the Middle East wants to get in to Europe? Yeah, how come, why, why is it like that? No, there is an argument on the other side of that. It's, it's like, well, the Middle East is in a mess because the West bombed it, and that's true. And the crazy thing is that before things like the Iraq war, there were one million people on the streets in Britain protesting against it. As a conservative estimate, one million. So that would be one in every 60 people, not just adults, one in every 60 people. It's a huge volume of people that protested against this this action, this military action in a foreign country, which um, I'm pretty sure is illegal anyway. And, um, and so these were people who were trying to defend the rights of people in the Middle East and stop their government from doing something bad. And of course the government didn't listen because when was the last time the government listened to the people? Well, the government only listened to the people if they're afraid of the people. If the government know that the people are going to do exactly what they say they're going to do, then the government has complete control and democracy only works when the government fears the people. If people fear the government, you don't really have a democracy anymore. And I think what we've seen recently is an example of government dictating to people, not through laws, not through laws, very important, not through laws, through legislation and, 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 and bills and advice to people acting as if things were laws, dictating to people what they should do and people following it. And this only empowers the government even more to take further steps forward. So it's very important that people resist actions which are not practical, not logical, not helpful, such as looting, basically, large shops and, and stores, uh, which, which absolutely doesn't help. And why is it that the blacks also want to get into white neighborhoods? Why is it that blacks talk about fear of blacks, right? That, um, that there's several classic speeches by prominent black leaders who say that when they're walking home at night and they hear footsteps behind them and they turn around and they see a white person, they feel relieved because they know that that 80% of the on the black crime, at least 80%, is committed by blacks. And um, that's sad. It's not that it's not that whites don't commit crime. In fact, if you're looking at, let's take an example of this. Take a look at, uh, say, the top 20 richest people in the world. They will be um, white, as far as I'm, I'm aware, and um, it's not that they're not involved in crime, of course, different kind of crime there. So uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to parse through the information and uh, look, at, uh, look at how it all pans out. And I think as long as we all try to help each other out and reject what I would be, it, it, well, what would be real oppression, then uh, then we can all, then we all just help each other and the world would be a nicer, nicer place, basically. But check out those videos, check out those videos. Um, interesting as well that uh, the, uh, the region of Seattle in the United States experiencing a very 
interesting movement at the moment where protesters have um, cordoned off an area of the city and they've they've said D this is ours now this is a self-governing region we're not part of the united states we're self we're a self-governing region and this is the uh, anti and black lives matters groups have taken part of the city and said okay we're going to control part of the city because we only feel safe in our own world in our own environment and these are the people who were running demonstrations chanting no no trump no wall no usa at all you, you can you can find this quite easily across the board online hundreds of thousands of protests not just one hundreds of thousands of protests because it was coordinated um and uh it's coordinated shown by you know the funneling of of the money into those organizations it was coordinated it was political um it was essentially democrat not many republicans are good it's just the way it was right and th there's also these you know you name it you think you understand it there's there's the rhino organizations as well the, the republican in in name only and i know that if you're listening to this you might understand all this already but remember there's a lot of people who don't there's a lot of people who don't follow politics a lot of people who are not awake a lot of people who don't have time for it because they're, they're, they're too busy living their lives trying to succeed trying to survive they don't understand it that there's these groups out there which th th these people who will flip-flop left and right depending upon which way the wind is blowing thinking that everybody's got a 10 second memory and nobody's going to be able to remember things um, and that's true to a certain extent our attention span has been annihilated basically over the the 20th century where a person could focus for maybe an hour at the beginning of the 20th century um, it's probably a slight exaggeration but it's down to seconds now it's down to seconds and um, the, the final straw in understanding this I think is the, the TikTok culture where hey make a video in 15 seconds or something and then on to the next video and on to the next video. now some of these things are fun it's fun it's fun to watch um, but it does train the mind and trick the mind into thinking that you need that new rush of the consistent new rush like a dopamine hit um, anyway, so the protesters, the, the Black Lives Matter and the anti have taken over this area of, of Seattle. The very first thing they did when they took it over was they set up borders and barricades. And they stole the borders and barricades. They, they stole them from surrounding property developments and they set them up around the encampment. Yeah, so no Trump, no no wall, no USA at all. But they, they, the first thing they do is they build a wall for, for their own protection right um, the second thing they do is they have their own policing this is these are the people who say defund the police right the second thing they do is they have their own they, they create their own their own policing there uh, by people who quite probably have some kind of weapon on them I imagine and then they loot all the stores in the area that they've appropriated to themselves and they use all those resources not thinking about the people who have businesses in that area or where the resources came from um you know, of course they do receive some donations but they've definitely looted all all the, all the stores there and the funny thing was that a large group of um, homeless people who were very unhappy about what happened came and took away a lot of their resources if you can if you're going to set up a community and your community gets destroyed by the local homeless community then uh, <laughs> then then you know you're not really setting a good example of a very safe environment um, you know I respect the fact that people want to create their own self-governing autonomous zones um, I think it should be done through debate and discussion rather than robbery um, and, and also there, there's all these acts there's all these 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 uh, according to the police chief um, uh, uh, I'm not sure what her name is um, but um, very eloquent 
lady and um, she's saying that, that there's a problem because the police can't get in to stop the robberies, the violent acts and also rapes that are happening within that, that area. And that's coming from the police. So, um, interesting to watch that fall apart. I've seen that happen many times in my life that people have taken over areas and thought, yeah, we can, we, we, we're going to appropriate this or, or use this or you see it with people taking over abandoned buildings sometimes and it almost always ends in disaster because in, unless it's set up by an intelligent group of people over a long period of time with planning and understanding <laughs> um, it, it doesn't work you don't just build a housing um, what estate Right, just like that, right? It takes years of planning and thought and you've got to look at the land and you've got to think about how we're going to get power there. You've got to think about sanitation. You've got to think about the canals you're going to build. You've got to think about the foundations. You've got to think about access and roads, um, the channels for all the electricity. You've got to think about um, the positioning of the buildings. You've got to talk to architects. You've got to look at which materials to use. It's a massive, massive project to do something like that. You can't just take over what somebody else has built up over years and understand it. Look, look what happened in South Africa, right? On the farms. It's like, oh no, we need to return these farms to the, 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 the original communities of, of people who lived on the land who didn't build up the farms because it was people who came in that built up the farms, built up the networks, built up the businesses, and then, then they were just given to other people and they fell apart. And this, this affected the supply chain, it affected getting food to people, it caused starvation, it caused hunger, um, and a wide variety of other social problems, you know, essentially just leading to crime. Because when everything falls apart, you know, it falls apart, right? Right. Um, and, and that's part of the understanding that logic saves lives and we need to do things in the right way. There's a right way for a reason. We have morals for a reason. We have culturally appropriate ethics for a reason. There's a reason for things. Now, the reason, you might disagree with the reason, but you have to understand that there's a reason for the culture to exist, right? Um, in, in, in all cultures. Um, the West have been predominantly practical in a lot of things that they've set up. They've gone too far in, in certain aspects. Um, we saw that in the, the, the attempt to dominate, which is wrong, which came out through uh, World War II. Um, and uh, all of the negativity surrounding that. Anyway, what, what, what's the point? It's simple things. We're, 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 we're simple people who need simple things in, in essence. And um, the amount of illogical, seemingly illogical behavior, of course, it's going to seem illogical from the outside. When you're on the inside, that there's a reason for everything, right? There's a reason why the nursery schools are open, but the pubs are closed. Yeah, there's a reason why leftist orientated educational establishments can continue to indoctr indoctrinate the children while people can't get together and discuss what is happening. The, the insanity of what is happening within their local communities. Um, and it's sad, you know, I visited uh, I visited a shop yesterday and talked to a lady about business and, and customers and, and how things are going. And it's dire. It's, it's bad. It, it's really bad. I saw reports this morning about more global international chains collapsing, uh, more jobs being lost. Um, and, and that's going to affect families everywhere it's going to affect communities it's going to cause a complete reorientation of certain 
certain elements of culture, it's hard. It's hard for people. It's hard to escape it as well. Right now, as media bombards us consistently with the new plans, the new ideas, the new the new normal. Sometimes you just you you got to get away. Sometimes you've got to get away. You've got to break. You got to get you got to get your head right. You got to get your mind set. <laughs> it's a classic example. Sometimes you've got to get lost to find yourself. Yeah, it's like that old saying: "Not all those who wander are lost." So true, so true. But still, we're all searching for for something. And whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, whatever you're searching for, even if you don't know what you're searching for, everything you do, everything that happens is dictated by by now. It's dictated by what you do at this moment in time. In this moment. That's what matters. That's what matters. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to make progress. It's going to be difficult to be successful on a business or individual level because success requires some kind of disruption. It requires some kind of change. It requires the creation of some kind of diversion or divergent reality. Seek and you shall find something. So I just talked about, you know, big chains going down. Um, here's a blog, toronto.com. Tim Hortons just closed all stores across Canada. That's going to affect a lot of people in a lot of different communities. And, you know, this is a result of not a global virus, but a pandemic of reactionary behavior without people fully understanding, fully understanding the consequences of their actions. Yeah, this is a war. It's a war on Western culture. It's a war on capitalism. It's a war on success. And remember that whether like it or not, capitalist culture has brought more people out of poverty than any other culture, right? Because it's allowed people to follow their dreams. It's given people that space to find their own place. So the article reads, although some new spots are expected to open in Canada, many old locations will be closed permanently. This repositioning will include the closure of all company operated stores. Tim Hortons explained. We will restructure our company operated business in Canada over the next two years with the potential of all additional stores being closed. And, and look at what's happening there. They're saying that you can only have half the number of people, sometimes only 25% the number of people who would normally be in your store. There's no way that, that people are going to be able to survive, especially in general stores or, or in restaurants, for example. How are they going to be able to survive? And what's going to happen is it'll be novel for a while. People will go there. The prices will increase and then people won't be able to afford to go there at all. And it also, it'll also it also mean the layoff of staff because that's what will happen of, What will happen first because people will try to save money. Um, and you can't produce quality a lot of the time when you're trying to save money, right? The company estimates that it has taken a hit of approximately 2.2 billion US dollars since the beginning of the C-19 pandemic. And this is as a result of government actions, as a result of governments not allowing things to be regular, not keeping things regular, as a result of governments coming in with really ridiculous recommendations such as social distancing, which doesn't help anybody. All it does is reduce the amount of communication. Com communicable. It's one of these communicable, I can't say it, communicable diseases. 
Right. Life is a communicator. Com com I can't say it. Communicable. Is that a word? I think it's a word. Right. Huh. Yeah. And it's not really social distancing. It's just so social isolation, isn't it? It's just keeping people away from people. That's all it is. Um, <laughs> right. And they give you the term social distancing. Right. They give you the term because they, they've gamed it out in advance. They've gamed it out. They, they've, they've worked out what it is that you're going to accept. They've worked out what, what, what you consider to be acceptable. And they get you to focus on all the wrong stuff, right? They get you to focus. The Guardian.com points out that an extra 10,000 dementia. What is wrong with my pronunciation? An extra 10,000 dementia deaths in England and Wales occurred in just the month of April. Just April. Um, and <laughs> they describe it as just switching off. <laughs> as, if, as if we're machines. Right. They died because they just switched off. Oh yeah. It's a war of ages. It's a war against the aged. Notice how we've been distanced distanced from the older generation. Notice how notice how the kids don't see the older generation as the teachers anymore, as the leaders anymore, as the leaders get younger and the teachers get younger and the teachers are people without worldly experience and the teachers haven't traveled and the English teachers haven't written books and the science teachers haven't done great science experiments and the geography teachers haven't traveled the world and you, you see what I'm saying? The sports teachers were never professional sports players, although in sports you kind of have to be good at sport in order to teach board, right? I mean, how many math teachers are really mathematicians? How many art teachers are great artists who have been able to sell their art? It's, it's one thing to create, but it's another thing to sell your, your creation, right? I mean, what made Picasso so, so famous? One of the things was the patronage and support of his work, allowing him to sell his work, allowing him to continue his art. Um, and they don't, they don't tell you about that, right? They just expect you to find a job as a, an artist or a digital artist working for somebody else. Anyway, there were almost 10,000 unexplained extra deaths among people with dementia in England and Wales in April, according to official figures that have prompted alarm about the severe impact of social isolation on people with the condition. The data from the Office for National Statistics reveals that beyond deaths directly linked to COVID-19, there were 83% more deaths from dementia than usual in April, with charities warning that a reduction in essential medical care and family visits were taking a devastating toll. It's horrendous that people with dementia have been dying in their thousands, said Katie Lee, Chief Executive Officer at Alzheimer's Society. We've already seen the devastating effect of coronavirus on people with dementia who catch it, but our research reveals that the threat of the virus extends far beyond that. A survey of 128 care homes by Alzheimer's Society reveals that 79% report that lack of social contact is causing a deterioration in the health and well-being of their residents with dementia. Let me read that again. A survey of 128 care homes by Alzheimer's Society reveals that 79% report that lack of social contact is causing a deterioration in the health and well-being of their residents. Relatives of those with dementia in care homes have spoken of their loved ones feeling confused and abandoned. They stop eating and lose the ability to speak. One man told the charity he was really fearful my wife won't recognize me. 
at the end of this. And this is what we're doing to our families. This is what we're doing to our culture. This is what we're doing to our society. Dailymail.co.uk reports quickie no fault divorces could be legal from next month. A quickie, right? You know what quickie usually refers to, right? Now they're calling marriage marriages quickies, a quick marriage, right? Because <laughs> like quick is good, like fast food, right? Yeah, a fast marriage. Well, I had a fast marriage when I was in my 20s because, you know, in your 20s you experiment with things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how well did that go with building a family? Uh -huh. How well did that go with living as a single parent? How, how well did that go with finding a new partner? Because who wants to have a partner who has the children of other people? Um, like, I'm not saying it's bad and wrong and that mistakes don't happen, right? But, um, yeah, it's, it's better that you don't burn the cake, right? <laughs> it's better that you take care, right? And it's hard to find a partner once you've already got kids because every time someone looks at the kids, they're going to see the face of the other partner, right? Well, not every time, because some people are able to see beyond and get round and get over, but it's always going to be there in the subtext of what's going on. People don't want to talk about it, but it's always going to be there. So th this is just um, making a mockery of the institution of marriage, which in the very vow is, you know, to to love and to hold and to cherish and for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, and sickness and health till death do us part, right? And at least 50% of people are bullshitting when they take the vows, at least, because it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> so, yay, Russian, rush out, fuck up, destroy, that's what's going to happen. But then that's the kind of world that has been manufactured and created around us. This is the kind of insanity that we now live within, not just within families, but within the world in general and one of the things that I like about Facebook is a lot of things I don't like about it but one of the things that I like is that that little memories section where you can see what you were doing on this day last year and this day two years ago and this day three years ago because um, if you're like me and you do a lot of things every day and you forget stuff sometimes it's nice to remember like um, Yesterday I was looking at where I was on this day last year. It's like, oh yeah, I was there with those people and that was great. And where I, what I was doing on this day two years ago, three years ago, like, oh, I was at the pool in, in, in that country and we were sunbathing and, and swimming or, um, you know, the kids did this or the kids did that. Because when you got kids, it's just a nonstop conveyor belt of insanity, really. Um, especially the more kids you have. And you need to have at least three it's my advice right it's just, it's just me I, I think you need to have at least three kids and th there's very specific reasons for that of course because your first kid is like the first experiment who you know they, they suffer from you getting everything wrong and making lots of mistakes right then you get the second kid where you get things a bit more correct and the uh, you know, the first kid can teach the second kid some stuff and, uh, and yeah simplifying it right because it's a whole like joyous wondrous experience of self-exploration to be a parent um, and then to, to understand society and families on larger scales and how communities work and I you know it, it's it's it, to 
to not be or to try to not be selfish about things um, yet to want to be selfish for your own kids so so it's a whole myriad of things and then you need a third kid because by the time the the third kid comes along maybe you'll be able to get things right in terms of parenting so um, so they get you know, the best of, of all worlds um, a lot of people will argue, oh, well, you can't dictate, you can't dedicate time to all your kids if you if you ha if you have three three kids. How many people dedicate time to ridiculous stuff on a daily basis, whether it's your TV show or listening to some music album or having a conversation or even work, which is a ridiculous activity a lot of time for a lot of people, or traveling or Right, it, it nothing beats the challenge to yourself that is the upbringing of kids. Because um, then you got to ask yourself questions. You got to ask yourself, am I doing things right? You've got to think about your future, your health, their future, their health. Um, it's crazy, and. What I, what I wanted to say was, uh, I was looking through the, the the memories section on Facebook and it, it popped up with an, an infographic that I created and posted years ago. And it's so relevant today. It's so relevant. Let me read for you. In 2009, Dr. Marcia Angel, uh, or Angel, um, of the New England Journal of Medicine wrote, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And you think the news reports today are accurate? You think the medical studies today are accurate? You think it's any less corrupt than it was before? Corruption infiltrates all institutions eventually. Second quote, Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, recently wrote, much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analysis and flagrant conflicts of interests, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. As one participant put it, poor methods get results. And these are the people that we trust with our health. Do you trust them? Do you trust them? Do you trust the people? Do you trust the families? <laughs> I don't know. I prefer to ask questions, right? I prefer to ask questions. Because as we look around us and we see society quite healthy, people quite healthy, businesses moving forward, things returning to normal, boom, suddenly the World Health Organization announces this pandemic is far from over. Daily cases have hit a record high. This was after them being quiet for a couple of weeks because we had to have a worldwide race war, um, which didn't bite. So we're back to the... Let's scare everybody again with this invisible enemy, which of course is a deep operation run by the fantastic Blue Army. Note at least half of Singapore's newly discovered coronavirus cases show no symptoms, no symptoms, no symptoms. The co-head of the government's virus task force told Reuters on Monday, reinforcing the city-state's decision to ease lockdown restrictions very gradually. L look, if you go in hard, come out hard, right? <laughs> take that, take that however you want to take that. Yeah. Van Kerkhove said, is that right? 
that's that name right, said that many countries doing contact tracing had identified asymptomatic cases but we're not finding that they caused further spread of the virus, adding, it's actually very rare. Hmm. Hmm. Asked about the technical cooperation with the United States after President Trump's announcement 10 days ago that he was terminating its relationship with the World Health Organization, which is, of course, just a um, medical, military, mafia arm of the global establishment, um, run by China. Um, uh, the president said that the World Health Organization relies heavily on experts from um, the centers of disease control. Yeah, as if you can control disease. You can be practical and sensible. You can have clean water and fresh air. Right, that's how you control disease. And the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and National Institute of Health and National Institute of Health. There's, there have never been so many unhealthy people in the United States ever, right? Ever. And this is since the creation of national health institutions. Insane, right? Insane. It's like there have never, there, there have never been so many illiterate people in the United States. Um, since the creation of the education system. Uh, but then we believe, don't we? We believe. We believe the hate. We believe the fear porn. We believe the institutions. Right? Right? You've been watching the video version. Here's a picture of protesters. No Trump, no wall, no USA at all. But we'll take this fence. <laughs> They're just stealing and looting everything they can from everyone who's built up stuff as if these college um i don't know what to call college advocates no graduates no um um instigators mm, agitators that would be the word right as if these agitators with their agitation propaganda are actually going to garner real support by destroying property. They've built nothing, they steal everything, it's not the pinnacle of clever. You've got to think about how you're doing things, you've got to think about your approach, your approach to life, your approach to your art. You've got to think about the process. You've got to consider. But um, it's okay for them because the media is just going to, in general, call them protesters and not rioters and looters. And it's it's going to support what they do because there's an agenda to to everything, right? And without the media, huh, right? You know, without the media, we wouldn't know that there's a virus out there. We wouldn't know at all. And it's interesting how, here's a report about how governments are hiring, local governments are hiring PR firms to shape the messages that they are putting out regarding health. An uh, example from Los Angeles, despite having a fully staffed county communications team, Fox 11 has exclusively obtained contracts showing Los Angeles County is spending $1.9 million to hire two public relations firms for the purpose of guiding the county's coronavirus messaging. Right? <laughs> One world with money to burn. That's what we've got. Money to burn. But the protesters like that. Um, here's a report about the idiots on parade because the protesters are not exactly sure what they're fighting. Um, um, 
interviewer on the street in Britain was asking people, why are you tearing down these statues? And, and uh, <laughs> oh, uh, we don't know. It just seems like a good thing to do. do. Do you know who this person was? Do you know what they did? Like they're tearing down the statues of the people who were actually in charge of ending slavery, right? In charge of en who ended slavery? White Christian Europeans, predominantly white Christian Europeans, we're talking 95%, ended slavery. They made it illegal. Now you might you might want to disagree with that, right? But it, it's just a fact. Did you know that only 20% of slavery was run by white people? Do you know that slavery existed for tens of thousands of years around the world before it was made illegal because it was immoral and it was made illegal by the West. Do you know that slavery still exists today in Africa? Do you think the Muslims a lot of the time in Africa don't treat their wives like like slaves? Why do, why do you think they've, they've got these people covered up? Why do you think they, they've got them covered up? It's not because they might be beautiful and people might be attracted to the beauty. It's not because of that at all. It's because most of them have been abused uh, a lot of them are actually from the, the slave trade, a lot of them have been bought, a lot of them have been kidnapped from families. Um, this goes on all the time. I'm sorry to break it to you. It's a harsh, hard world in certain places. This stuff goes on, right? And it was the white predominantly European Christians who put an end to it. Did you know in history there was more black on black slavery than white on black? Did you know that? Did you know I'm, I'm sorry to, to break that truth to you, right? Now I'm not saying that white people didn't manipulate black people as if as if that's even you know a subject or a topic so you white this and black that because it's all about individual people, right? I meet a person, I'm gonna judge them by the content of their character. I'm going to judge them by how intelligent they are in their choices. I'm going to judge them by the, the choices that they've made and what they've learned and how they express themselves to me. I'm not going to judge them by their, their size or their weight or uh, the color of their hair. I mean, all of these things communicate messages or the number of tattoos that they have. I, I'm, but all those things are interesting as well. You know, people say it doesn't matter if a person's fat, right? Um, but health matters, right? Yep, you can be obesely overweight and be the nicest person in the world, but you still need to do something about that weight problem. You can be extremely thin, almost anorexic, and be the nicest person in the world. But you still need to do something about that weight problem. Yeah. You can be the nicest person in the world and not take exercise. But you still need to do something about that. You can be the nice per nicest person in the world and not get enough vitam vitamins and minerals. You still need to do something about that. Right. We've all got things to work on. <laughs> We've all got things to work on. Just just look at the history of slavery. See which countries and cultures did it. Right. See how people in Europe got tired of the serfdom and the landlord culture and they went to the United States to get some level of freedom. A lot of them traveling as indentured um, slaves, basically, whites and blacks. And there has been a great movement in history to free people, but it's been led by intellectually orientated cultures who understand on an individual basis that Enslavement is wrong, and it begins with mindset. 
begins with mindset. Do no harm, right? Do no harm. <laughs> right. And now they're attacking the statues of Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill. The, the, the anti-fascists are attacking the statue of William Churchill. Um, is, is this an intelligent movement? Well, it's not everybody in the movement. Well, but it is the important faction, right? Because this is how they express themselves on a public level, <laughs> right? Yeah, how is this? Uh, how is that? How is this freedom of allowing this to happen working out for you when the police stand and watch people graffiti and destroy statues? But if you uh, try to stop people, the police arrest you. Seriously, they arrest you. I mean, talk about a backwards society with a backwards culture. Oh, and here's the mayor of. Uh, the um, here's the the mayor of the American county that has this self-governing autonomous zone, and he doesn't even know that that self-governing autonomous zone actually exists. <laughs> he was questioned about it. He's like, "Oh, I don't know what you're talking about." Yeah, right. Disconnected from reality. Disconnected from people. Disconnected from the world. Right. How do you how do you respond to that? How do you how do you counter that? Yeah. I think you counter it by, by not shutting down in your mind. You counter it by remaining open to the possibilities that always exist. By remaining op open to the, the the unique opportunities that present themselves by being aware by looking around, by putting yourself in the right place at the right time to witness the right things. You know, put yourself in a place where you can learn something, not just about the world, but but also about, about yourself. You know, put yourself in a place where you can learn something and you can take that learning and you can teach it, teach it to others. You know, put yourself in a place where you have to respect people who are different. Put yourself in a position to be a leader, lead by example and garner some respect because you lead by example, just like a parent would. Lead by example, don't use force, don't use force. Because force is failure, you can't force someone to respect you. Because if you think respect means obedience, then you're an oppressor. And oppressors are never truly respected. They're simply feared. Like a parent demanding that you be respected by your children while treating them disrespectfully will only result in their resentment of you, which will grow exponentially over time and then once they're adults and you grow old if you decide that oh you don't have time for them or, or it's too difficult or it's too messy then you decide to put them into a or you know they they decide they decide to put you right if your kids haven't learn from you the respect and the care, then they're going to put you in a nursing home instead of caring for you. And then the truth of everything that happened will become more clear. It'll become crystal for those with open hearts. Respect. Respect is key. Respect your children. Respect the different opinions. It doesn't mean you have to agree. You can respectfully disagree. What's the rule? The rule is treat your children, 
the way that that you would like to be treated. Yeah, treat your children the way that you would like to be treated when you're old and you can't take care of yourself and you can't look after yourself when it's hard to get up the stairs when it's hard to bend down and pick up something that you've dropped when it's hard to remember things where did I put this where did I put that yeah as your world slows down but but time speeds up right as your world slows down but time speeds up <laughs> how are you gonna how are you gonna cope how are you gonna cope you're not gonna be able to cope when you're old and you're on your own it's not gonna work right you know it, it it's crazy you you have to live as an individual with individual ideas but we also have to understand that the working together with other people is how we grow it's how we learn it's how we develop it's how we come to know things have your adventures have your adventures but realize that everything swings back around everything comes back around the time and care and effort that you put into caring for your kids in the early years in the early months this will probably be the time and care and effort and attention that your kids will put into caring for you in your late years and in your last months something to think about really so as my computer crashes and no more data is suddenly available the great comedy of life <laughs> if you're watching the video this will make sense if you're listening to the audio you just have to take it for granted that <laughs> sometimes things don't quite go the way that I'd like them to but that's okay um, if you live to fight another day there's some success in that right there's some success wherever you are whatever you're doing I wish you a great day I hope that you find time to do something that you enjoy with with your friends with your family with your kids with your parents with your grandparents with all the people you care about around about you and as always don't forget to tell the ones you love that you love them my name is G I represent the Academy uh, you can find more information under Graham William Hendry on Facebook there's five Facebook pages check them out um, also on Twitter Instagram the Academy of Language Therapy and life coaching is on YouTube check out the videos great new series on the work of John Taylor Gatto check that out and um, that's it for today guys stay safe and I'll speak to you again soon